It is the 28th of October, 1492. Three Spanish caravels led by Christopher Columbus glide across the sea, when suddenly the monotonous hiss of the wind is broken by a cry from the lookout in the crow's nest. Tierra, tierra. The aroma of the flowers and the trees is delightful beyond all description, notes Columbus in his diary. The song of birds and cicadas can be heard throughout the night. The air is gentle and balmy, neither hot nor cold. Here I would like to live forever. Columbus thought he had discovered the gateway to Asia. What he had actually discovered was the largest island in the Caribbean with an indigenous population of approximately 100,000 people. The coastline, nearly 6,000 kilometers long, is mostly lined with mangrove forests and swamps, making exploration difficult. Cuba was originally mapped by Diego de Velázquez, later governor of Cuba, who traveled the length of the island by land and by boat. In the process, he founded seven towns, or villas, including La Habana, which was later changed to Havana. The capital of Cuba, Havana, is the country's heart and soul. Every morning, the streets of Havana fill with people. A fifth of the Cuban population, over two million inhabitants, live here. Havana is the largest city in Cuba, and indeed, in all of the Caribbean. Today, after a 400-year history checkered with triumph and tragedy, Cuba remains a vibrant country, filled with people who enjoy life. Havana wasn't always a bustling metropolis. For two centuries, Havana remained a sleepy little town that came to life one day a year with the docking of the Spanish treasure fleet. In 1555, three years after it became Cuba's capital, Havana was plundered by pirates. Work on El Moro Bastion and the Castillo de la Real, the forts overlooking Havana's bay, started almost immediately but it would be 200 years before the city's potential was truly realized. The Malecon, Havana's waterfront boulevard, is a popular meeting place. The cool, refreshing ocean wind brings a delightful respite from tropical heat. For real action, however, the place to be is El Paseo de Martí, Havana's main street named after the famous revolutionary poet José Martí. Still called by its old name, El Prado, this is Havana's grandest street, reminiscent of the grand boulevards of Spanish cities. Throughout its history, students have played a major role in Cuban political life. In the 18th century, Havana's students were a constant thorn in the side of their moribund Spanish rulers. A hundred years later, students hastened the 1959 victory for Castro's revolutionaries by attacking the presidential palace in a commandeered truck emblazoned with a slogan promising fast delivery. Today's students, however, think about the things that concern young people the world over. Music and singing, ideas, and enjoying each other's company. La Plaza de Armas, Havana's old city square, is a reminder of the time when the military garrison equaled the population. Lining the Plaza de Armas are some of the city's most significant historical buildings. 
El Palacio de los Capitanes Generales was built in 1776, after a British occupation that followed a long siege. Foreign trade had been prohibited by Spain, and the British ended the ban, opening North American markets to Cuban produce. Among the luxurious furnishings is a throne to be used by the Spanish monarch on state visits. The monarch, however, never did visit Cuba, and the magnificent chair remains unused. After independence in 1898, the governor's palace became Havana's city hall and was later turned into a museum. La Plaza de la Catedral is the site of a lively market on Saturdays. The church square still captures the essence of centuries past. Havana's Baroque Cathedral, dating from the same period as the palace, was consecrated in 1789, the year of the French Revolution. Dedicated to the Virgin of Immaculate Conception, it once contained the grave of Columbus. His remains were moved to Spain after Cuban independence. Cuban music is the fusion of two vastly different musical traditions. The rhythms are African, the vocal harmonies Spanish, and musicians play classic Spanish instruments like the guitarra tres, a guitar that has three different strings instead of the traditional six. Each of the strings is doubled. From Africa, we have the percussion instruments, like the maraca and the bass. Even the guitar, which is a bed of an African instrument, because it marks the rhythm and helps the dancer move and dance. It makes people dance and enjoy themselves. The popularity of Cuban music is understandable given the music's infectious rhythms. The evidence of this infatuation is everywhere, from joyous street fests to classical performances. Havana's Gran Teatro is home to one of the most talented ballet troupes in Latin America. The ballerinas work hard to master the intricacies of their performance. The ballet troupe continues to draw crowds with lavish shows put on each evening at the world-famous Tropicana. Cuban music became popular all over the world in the years following World War I. At that time, Havana became the entertainment capital for fun-starved Americans seeking a respite from prohibition. Hotels and casinos mushroomed all over town. The guests in the new hotels, and some of the owners, included an array of prominent American gangsters, among them Al Capone. But gangsters weren't the only fun seekers flocking to Havana. Many people came to play, to gamble, and to enjoy nightlife like the Tropicana Review, the extravagant show that came to symbolize Cuban entertainment. Today, the Tropicana Review is still playing to packed houses. The program attempts to embrace all of Cuban culture, including that of the pre-Columbian people whose traditions continue to influence modern Cuban arts.
To dance at the Tropicana is a grand achievement. This young woman has realized her dream. Dancing always interested me because my sister is also a dancer and she taught me to dance at home. I don't wake up usually until around 10 in the morning, exercise, read, visit friends, and after lunch return to rehearsing. I practice until 4 or 5 and return to the cabaret. This is my life. Music and dance are present in every facet of Cuban life. At the end of a working day, many Cubans go to their local Casa de Trova to dance to the rhythms of local musicians. Sometimes, the venue is not outside the building, but on top of it. The term Casa de Trova means House of Trova. A trova is a romantic ballad but the music played embraces the full-blooded Afro-Cuban rhythms. The entertainment in the local Casa de Trova competes every Saturday evening with an immensely popular TV program devoted exclusively to Cuban music. In the heady days before the revolution, fun seekers and literati filled Havana's hotels, bars, and casinos. La Floridita restaurant was the favorite haunt of perhaps the most famous American to stay in Cuba, Ernest Hemingway. The Nobel Prize winning author lived in the Havana suburb of San Francisco de Paula. Hemingway was a great connoisseur of liquor, and his favorite drink was a rum daiquiri, as made at La Floridita. Hemingway's house still looks as if the great writer had just stepped out for a walk. The walls are decorated with hunting trophies acquired on his safaris in Africa. Hemingway wrote of man's battles with nature. The fishing village of Coimar near Havana provided the inspiration for his acclaimed story, The Old Man and the Sea. Ninety-five-year-old Gregio Fuentes, the captain of Hemingway's boat, recalls this great artist not for his writing, but for being the kind of man he was. I remember Hemingway. He was a great man. He spoke seven languages fluently. When he spoke Spanish, he sounded as he was born right here, in Cuba, and he was such a good, kind person. He was always giving money away to people who need it. For example, if you would meet a man who couldn't afford tools, he would give them money to buy them. He was a real gentleman who cared about all the people, to me, he was like family, like a brother or a son. When he died, I felt like I would lose a close relative. I miss him. I miss him very much. Santiago de Cuba, the second largest city on the island, is located on the southern tip of Cuba. The first house in Santiago was built in 1514 for Diego de Velázquez. In the style of Spanish houses of the period, the ground floor was used for commercial purposes, while private life took place upstairs. Santiago soon became Spain's most important port in the Americas. 
Velasquez's young secretary, Hernán Cortés, launched his expedition to Mexico and South America from here. After Cortés' conquest of the Aztec and Inca empires, the city grew quickly. As more immigrants from Spain arrived, the wooden shacks of the first settlers were replaced by palaces and richly decorated buildings. Not all newcomers to the Caribbean came to farm or mine. Lured by tales of riches, adventurers from Europe crossed the Atlantic, and soon hundreds of pirate ships were terrorizing Caribbean waters. The Spaniards responded by building forts at harbor entrances. Santiago's fort, the Castillo del Moro, failed to keep the invaders out. In 1642, the infamous English pirate Henry Morgan captured the city and sacked it mercilessly. Santiago's fortunes were revived in the early 19th century when 30,000 affluent French families moved here following a slave revolt and war of independence on the nearby island of Haiti. Santiago became Cuba's intellectual capital in 1552, the Cuban capital was moved to La Habana, but Santiago retained its strategic importance. Large copper mines in the area ensured continued prosperity, and the city became a center for the fast-growing African slave trade. The Africans brought a unique culture to their new land, including religious practices which have been incorporated into Cuban beliefs. Cuban religion is mainly Catholic, but retains traces of Africa and the mysticism of voodoo. In the Columbus Cemetery, the largest in Latin America, with over 800,000 graves and 100,000 crypts, one crypt enjoys special prominence. It contains the grave of a young woman who dreamed of having a child, then died in her pregnancy. It is said that when the crypt was reopened, she was found cradling a baby in her arms. From this time on, people have come here to pray for fulfillment of their dearest dreams. The Black Virgin, a beloved religious symbol, is veiled in an aura of mystery because no one knows why she is black. The likeness dates back to the 16th century and is thought to have been copied from a 5th century African sculpture. The artist's inspiration turned out to be a happy choice. The Black Virgin is revered by both Christians and followers of Afro-Cuban religion, uniting believers of two distinct faiths. El Cobre Church is home to the patron of Cuba, the Holy Virgin, widely believed to be responsible for several miracles. As word spread, El Cobre Church became the Cuban equivalent of Lourdes, with pilgrims coming by the thousands. In pre-revolutionary times, Santiago de Cuba was famous for distilling rum, key ingredient in the Bacardi daiquiris that Hemingway so loved. Following the revolution, the Bacardi family relocated to Puerto Rico and its distilleries were seized by the state. Today, Santiago is still known for its rum, a brand called Habana Club. Rum is made from sugarcane, Cuba's major crop. The sugar harvest, or safra, is the most important source of income for Cuba, and therefore the country's busiest time of year. 
the safra once needed up to 600,000 macheteros, or cane cutters. Today, it is mostly mechanized, but it is still hard work. During the safra, workers live in the field, cooking, eating, repairing their machinery, until the crop is harvested. They only rest after the cane has been transported for processing to a sugar factory. The days when every plantation had its own small sugar mill are long gone. A lot of the sugar cane is consumed locally, often in the form of a popular soft drink, a refresco of sugar cane juice over ice. But sugar cane and its byproducts, molasses and alcohol, serve a far more important function than local refreshment. They have been Cuba's main export for centuries and still account for roughly 70% of Cuban exports. Trinidad, one of the original seven Spanish villas founded at the beginning of the 16th century, is located almost halfway down the island's southern coast in prime sugarcane country. The fields around the town were once full of black Africans, brought over to work as slaves on sugarcane plantations. Trinidad's main square still carries signs of colonial prosperity. Today, the place where rich planters went for an evening stroll is most often frequented by descendants of the plantation workers and by artists inspired by the town's Baroque beauty. The art gallery, just steps away from the square, showcases works of Cuban artists the influence of the tropical light, so important to the growth of the sugarcane, is present in most paintings. The town's streets are still paved with stones that came from the ballast of Spanish ships, ships that transported the riches of the Americas back to Europe. In Trinidad's market, a craftsman demonstrates another kind of art, weaving palm leaves into hats, baskets, and other everyday items. In addition to the strong hemp-like fiber, the palm's coconuts provide food and drink and are home to several species of birds. It is no wonder that the royal palm is prominently displayed in Cuba's coat of arms. Another significant Cuban crop, tobacco, was introduced into European life by the early explorers. Growing tobacco is quite difficult. The seedlings are nurtured in nurseries. After 45 days, the most promising plants are uprooted and planted in the fields. They grow there for another 40 days before being harvested. Much of the western part of Cuba, around the city of Pinar del Rio, is covered with fields of prime cigar leaf tobacco. Cuban cigars are widely acknowledged as the world's finest. Names such as Partagos, Romeo y Julieta, and Cohiba are like music to the ears of every cigar connoisseur. Cigar manufacture hasn't changed. The cigars are still rolled by hand. A cigar factory looks like a classroom. Rows of workers sit behind tables, faced by the reader, a person who reads aloud from a magazine or newspaper to make a monotonous task more interesting for the workers. Aquí se se califica por tres tres tipos de de, de hojas. We classify tobacco into three different kinds of leaf. The strong leaf, which give the cigar its potencies, the dry and purple leaf, which give it its character. 
Then there is the delicate leaf from the center of the plant. It is called the capa. And the person who rolls it is called el capote. This capa is grown under a fine clothes so that the sun rays won't strike it directly. That's how we get the delicate leaf that gives a cigar its presence. In recent years, the dangers of smoking have received much publicity. However, many Cubans still find a cigar a joyful, relaxing treat, which is perhaps not so surprising given the quality of Cuban cigars. Cuba is also known for the wealth beneath its coastal waters. Fish abound in Cuban waters, and the fishing industry, too long neglected, is making a comeback in the waters around Cienfuegos. The city has one of the country's few modern fish processing plants. Here, shrimps are being sorted for export. One of Cuba's newest ports, Cienfuegos was established in 1740. Its fort, the Castillo de Agua, was built to protect several nearby fishing villages and soon expanded to become one of Cuba's more important trade centers. One prosperous citizen financed the opening of a theater. Named after the benefactor, the beautifully restored Teatro Thomas Terry today doubles as a concert hall. From Cuba's port towns to the interior, it is the land that nurtures the country's inhabitants. And in the area around Camaway, cattle breeding is an important economic factor. Camaway was formerly known as Puerto Principe. Although located relatively far inland, it was indeed the principal port, accessed by vessels sailing up the Pedro River, which empties into the Caribbean to the south. The inland location failed to protect the city from pirate raids. It was burned to the ground and rebuilt several times. One of the characteristic features of Camaway are the huge terracotta urns called tinajones. In the old days, sailors used them to store water and oil. Today, they are mainly decorative, although they are sometimes used to gather rainwater. The other distinctive sight in Camaway is the cowboy wearing a beautifully sheathed knife in place of a Wild West six shooter. The Cuban cowboy's day starts at dawn and ends after dusk. As for electricity, we don't have any, but we have battery operating radios. So we get the news. I wake up at 5 in the morning. I spend all day working with the livestock. Then there is the sowing, taking care of the pigs. And we have to buy food for ourselves and the grocery, rice, sugar, and salt, stuff like that, and the rest we grow here. Any extra stuff we produce, we sell to the co-op. I go twice a year to La Habana to visit an aunt who lived there. The trip takes 10 to 12 hours. It is about 650 kilometers. I don't like the life in La Habana because it's so hectic. We always have to have a watch handy. Here in the country, we don't use watches. We go by the sun. Raising cattle requires few people. But when emphasis shifted from cattle to sugarcane and tobacco, Cuban plantation owners needed large numbers of slaves to work their farms and plantations. In the late 18th century, Haitian slaves rebelled and fought a successful war of independence, 
sending fear into the hearts of Cuban plantation owners. They feared independence would spark a slave revolt. But independence was in the air, and winds of change were blowing toward Cuban shores. In 1868, an enlightened plantation owner, Carlos Manuel de Cespedes, freed the slaves working in his sugar mill. Authorities responded by holding his son hostage, and when Cespedes refused to back down, they had his son executed. Cespedes became known as the father of the revolution, a particularly apt name given the tragic circumstances. The revolt for independence started on October 10, 1868. Within days, rebels seized the city of Bayamo, and set up a provisional government. The Cuban national anthem was written soon afterwards, and in November 1868, it was sung for the first time on the Bayamo church steps. Today, the anthem, which contained many uncomplimentary references to Spain, has been shortened to the first of its three stanzas. Ten years of fighting failed to resolve Cuba's independence struggle, and war-weary Cubans finally accepted Spanish promises to address many of their grievances. The gradual abolition of slavery was one of the few promises that was kept but other grievances were largely ignored, and in 1895, the fight for independence flared anew. For three years, the bitter fighting dragged on. Then on February 15, 1898, the USS Maine exploded while at anchor in Havana Harbor. Rumors of sabotage and Spanish atrocities fired the indignation of the American public. Sensational stories in the Hearst and Pulitzer papers whipped public sentiment to a frenzy. The United States declared war on Spain, and the Spanish-American War was launched. American troops soon landed in Cuba. The most famous battalion was the Rough Riders, led by future U.S. President Theodore Roosevelt. The tide now turned in favor of the Cubans, and under the terms of a peace treaty signed in December 1898, Spain withdrew from Cuba. The Republic of Cuba was established in 1902, and the U.S. was given a 99-year lease on a naval base on Guantanamo Bay, guarding the windward passage route to the Panama Canal. José Martí, a poet and universal hero, symbolizes the spirit of Cuba's ongoing quest for freedom. People everywhere sing the words to his song, Guantanamera. I want to share my luck with the poor people of the land. How humbling it is to wake up, to walk through a path without obstacles, where everybody greets you without doubting that the end will come, and peace will be the nectar of the future. Independence was now a reality, but for many Cubans, it was a terrible disappointment. Over the next 50 years, Cubans were ruled by governments as corrupt as their colonial predecessors. Frequent upheavals in the world price of sugar deepened the economic gloom. For most Cubans, life remained as hard as it had been prior to independence. In 1933, Fulgencio Batista, a former army sergeant, took power and commenced a long, repressive dictatorship. The U.S. kept its lease on Guantanamo Bay and continued economic involvement in Cuba. Batista retired in 1944. Then in 1952, he seized the government 
and suspended constitutional powers. Cuba was ready for another revolution. In the fall of 1958, Fidel Castro, a fiery young revolutionary, led a revolt that toppled the Batista government. Six years after his ill-fated assault on the Moncada barracks, Fidel Castro stood facing a jubilant crowd, his uniform casually open at the collar. He started his speech with the words, there is no longer an enemy. Within a few months of their victory, the revolutionaries embarked on a program of radical reform. One of its key moves was the nationalization of U.S. property, worth nearly one billion dollars. Fidel Castro proved to be an adept politician. American capital had made huge investments in Cuba. To many of the working poor, the country had merely traded its old colonial masters for American overlords. So when the new government seized American property, it enjoyed widespread support. Euphoria, however, was short-lived. Many Cubans were bitterly disillusioned as the new government turned to communism and thousands fled the country. In April 1961, aided by the CIA, 1,500 Cuban exiles launched an invasion from Panama, hoping to topple the Castro regime. They failed, and the whole operation, known as the Bay of Pigs from the place where the counter-revolutionaries landed, became famous for the way it was bungled. An American embargo on trade with Cuba followed. Then, Cuba's Soviet allies installed nuclear missiles on Cuban soil. The U.S. imposed a naval blockade, and the whole world held its breath as the two nuclear superpowers tried to stare each other down. The Soviets blinked first and withdrew the missiles. Castro's charisma touched the masses. To the humble Guajiro working his small plot of land, Castro was the brave romantic liberator, bringing freedom down from the mountains. It is true that for many Cubans, the revolution has brought tangible benefits, free education and health care for everyone, and a feeling of genuine independence. Not all change, however, is for the better. Shortages have resulted from the inefficiency of the central planning system. Cubans must cope with the frustrations of daily life while questioning their system. Many have left Cuba. Others seek answers. This retired worker has lived through many governments. He recalls the inequities of the Batista regime and supported Castro's revolution. But now he sees difficulties that he feels need to be addressed. I a Fidel Castro Ruz when he the age of 16 or 17 years. I knew Fidel Castro when I was 16 and 17 years old. Fidel always had a dream for the poor people and the triumph of the revolution on January 1st, 1959. It is very true that since the government took over, everything has changed. It used to be that only the politicians live well. The working class people went hungry and without necessities. That is why Cuba is for the good revolution. But the revolution has outgrown its idealistic stage, and the country must now grapple with serious economic problems. 
porque las personas van a los trabajos ahora y no tienen emotividad para trabajar. No tienen the motivation and feeling to work. When I work on the train during the years of the capital system, it was a strong system. Back then, four of us will do the job that 16 people do now. This is damaging to the country economy because they have to pay more salaries. The weak economy, combined with the ongoing American embargo, means that many consumer goods are scarce. Cars are a good example. As a result of the blockade, one sees many 40-year-old American cars on Cuban roads. Owners maintain them with loving care and the kind of loyalty usually reserved for old friends. Cars are hard to get, but fuel is even harder still. The U.S. trade embargo signed by President Kennedy in 1962 cut off the source of many supplies, including oil. In the countryside, fuel shortages mean that tractors have been replaced by oxen. Although Cuba does have oil fields, they only cover a small percentage of the country's needs. Besides, the heavy Cuban crude oil is unsuitable for refining into gasoline. The most popular mode of personal transport is the ubiquitous bicycle. Bicycles can traverse bumpy, difficult roads, and many Cubans find them the best way to get around. In some towns, bus stops have been specially adapted for use by cyclists. Before the revolution, Americans and Cubans acted like neighbors. Political events have created a barrier which is unfortunate, because the two countries have much in common. Both peoples cherish independence, and both love the game of baseball. Cubans excel at baseball and have captured the Olympic gold medal in that sport. In many towns, the thud of hooves and jingle of boot spurs have been replaced by the smack of a bat hitting a baseball. I have a friend called Jose, Jose Luis and Arturito. Those are my best friends. I come here to play baseball with them every day. In Cuba, she always wins, because it gives the players a thrill to win at baseball. They hug each other and shake hands, and other stuff too. A lot of people like to play baseball and watch it. Cubans also love boxing. Cuban boxers enjoy respect among their counterparts, and have also won several Olympic medals. Levanta la guardia, Sabón. Derechazo a la cabeza y derribado. Before the revolution, tourism was an important Cuban industry. Today, interest in Cuba as a vacation spot is enjoying a renaissance. The need for hard currency prevailed. And with some of the most beautiful beaches in the hemisphere, Cuba is rapidly becoming a popular holiday destination. From the haze-enveloped mountains of the Sierra Madre and Sierra Escambray, to the miles of idyllic beaches, an ever-increasing number of visitors are discovering the natural beauty of Cuba's landscapes.
New hotels are springing up to accommodate the sun seekers who come to Cuba's shores. Many of these hotels are joint ventures between the government and the operators. The first time since the revolution of 1959 that foreigners are allowed to own property in Cuba. Baradero is one of the better known resort cities. Conveniently located 140 kilometers west of Havana, it has been a resort since the early 1900s, when wealthy families from the nearby town of Cárdenas started building summer homes there. Faradero is blessed with a 20 kilometer long stretch of white sandy beach that is among the 10 cleanest in the world. But the shoreline is in trouble because the famous beach is being slowly eaten away by the ocean. Every year, millions of tons of sand have to be trucked in to make up for the erosion. Cayo Largo is one of several islands that make up the Archipelago de los Canareos off the southern coast of Cuba. Beach seekers drawn to these islands find them rich in attractions, including a coral reef that begs to be explored. Cayo Largo was once a pirate base, and as a consequence, many ships sank on the sharp coral. To this day, buried treasure rests on the seabed, waiting to be found. Acting as sentinels, protecting their territory, iguanas populate Cayo Largo and neighboring islands. They may look ferocious, but these mini descendants of dinosaurs pose no threat to humans. On the contrary, they are now a protected species. Most of the Cuban islands are relatively small, little more than spits of coral with some sand on top. Off the northern coast, however, there are several larger ones. One of these is Cayo Coco. Some 300 kilometers southeast of the Florida Keys, Cayo Coco is home to thousands of flamingos. The relative absence of people and an abundance of fish in the coral reefs make this an island paradise for these graceful birds. Cuba has over 300 species of birds, and many of them can be found in the Zapata Swamp. A veritable bird watcher's paradise, the Great Swamp of the Caribbean also offers thrills to anyone who will take a boat ride down its mysterious canals. Less charming swamp inhabitants include crocodiles. Farmed the way alligators are cultivated in Florida, these prehistoric relics are prized for their skins. Crocodile meat is occasionally served in restaurants. The taste and texture is halfway between chicken and pork. Before they become a meal, however, these reptiles require careful handling, not a job that appeals to everyone. To the Spanish, the natural wonders of Cuba were largely ignored. They had come to the New World seeking treasure, looking for gold. But there was not much gold to be found, and even the famed El Tesoro, Treasure Lake, in southeastern Cuba, contained nothing but a legend.
Today, it is the natural wonders of Cuba that entice modern-day explorers. From colonial splendor to political repression and a phoenix-like rebirth, history has woven an intricate tapestry of tragedy and triumph for Cuba's populace. Perhaps the words of a popular song best sum up the dreams of this vibrant people. I want to see this era give birth to another heart and that it won't die of suffering, pain. I want bread, I want wine, and a flower in my path. I hope my guitar will play another song. I want a kiss, a calm sea, and a reason, a light that illuminates, sparks a new love. Today's Cubans are a remarkably happy people who reflect on their yesterdays while anticipating their tomorrows. Beauty suffuses their lives. And as poets throughout the ages have always known, where there is beauty, there is romance and life. Quiero el trino de un gorrión, porque a fin de cuentas soy un soñador.